We've seen a number of times in the past that when we don't know the value of a number, we can let a letter stand for that number. And the letter is called a variable because its value will change from problem to problem. X will have a value in this problem, but in the next problem, X may have a different value. Now, uh, letters that stand alone are called variables, but also when, when numbers are multiplied times letters, they are also called variables. This would be a variable term because, after all, if we don't know the value of x, then we can't possibly know the value of 5x, you see. Until we're given the value of x, we don't know the value of 5x. And negative 2n is also a variable. Now, if a number is standing alone, like 5, you see, without a letter, then uh, its value is known, and 5 is the same value from problem to problem as a standalone number. And it's for that reason that standalone numbers are called constants because they constantly have the same value, you see. So these are variables. Now, variable expressions are expressions that contain variables. So here's a variable expression, here's another variable expression, and we'll have a lot more to say about what we can do with variable expressions. Basically, though, with variable expressions, we can do just two things. We can either find the value of the expression if we're given the value of the letters, or we can simplify, we can manipulate a little bit, perform some indicated operations. But that's all that we can do. Now, I want you to notice, um, even right now, that, that variable expressions contain no equal signs. And, and I'm going to point out the difference between expressions and equations. It's a very, very important mathematical idea. But expressions contain no equal signs. That's why all we can do with them is evaluate them, find their value, when given the value of letters, or we can manipulate them. But we can't solve them like we solve equations. All right, let's talk about evaluating. Evaluating means find the value of. So if we want to evaluate this, we're finding the value of the expression when given the value of letters. So we're going to evaluate this when given that x is negative 2 and y is 3. Now here's the process, or here's the, the form of this process. We want to write the expression as the first order of business. And in fact, the first two steps in this process are always going to be the same. We, we write the expression that we're trying to evaluate in the first step. And in the second step, we replace letters with numbers, and that's it. You see, we're going to replace x with negative 2, and we're going to replace y with 3. Now, when we replace this x with the negative 2, remember that 3x means 3 times x. So we want to indicate 3 times the number that stands for x, or, the, or that x stands for. And it's negative 2, so it's 3 times negative 2. I need to introduce the parenthesis to indicate the multiplication. That's the important idea here. It, it, this, isn't, this doesn't say 3 uh, minus x or 3 plus x, so we certainly wouldn't want this to say 3 minus 2. You see, it's 3 times the negative 2. All right, then minus 4 times whatever y is. y is 3. And here we go. So we introduce those parentheses when multiplication is indicated. Now we perform the indicated operations according to our order of operations agreement. So let's see, uh, inside parentheses we have nothing to do. We have no exponents. So we multiply and divide from left to right. So from left to right, 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. Now I'm going to go ahead and perform this operation as well because these two have nothing to do with one another. So I'm going to actually do two things at once. I've ad kind of advised against this. If there's any question about what, to, what to, you should and should not do, if there's any question whatsoever, then just do one thing at a time. But occasionally, we can do two things at a time. This multiplication has nothing to do with this multiplication, you see. It's just two multiplications from left to right. So we perform this one, negative 4 times 3, negative 12. So negative 6 with negative 12, I'm running out of room here. But collecting here, the signs are the same, so we add and we get 18, and it's negative 18. So I'll go out to the right and make this negative 18. Suppose we want to evaluate this expression when x is negative 3 and y is 2. So once again, we write the expression. And 
and then replace letters with numbers, and that's it in the first step. We want to do no operations. X is negative 3. Now, this minus sign precedes the X. The X now contains another minus sign, and it's important to put in two minus signs. The X that we're putting in, excuse me, <clears throat> let me think more clearly, let's see. We have <clears throat> the X is replaced with negative 3, so imagine a negative 3 right in here. So it's negative 3 that is squared. Now, the X is being squared here, so the negative 3 is being squared, and that's what's being indicated here. So it's real important to be careful with your replacement ideas and Y is 2, so here we go. Now, the, uh, in parenthesis, we only have negative 3, so inside parenthesis, we're already in simple form. We take care of the exponents next, and it means to square the negative 3. Now, negative 3 is the base of that exponent. This minus sign has nothing to do with that process, so I'll bring it down. Now, we're squaring negative 3, which means negative 3 times negative 3. That's positive 9, or simply 9. And then minus 6 divided by 2. And now, we're looking for multiplications and divisions from left to right. Oh, here we go. So we have 6 divided by 2, or we have negative 6 divided by 2. Either way, we're going to have a minus sign with a 3. You see, so it's negative 9 minus 3. Let me come up over here and put that down because I'm running out of room here. But it's negative 9, and then the negative of 6 divided by 2 would be minus 3. Collecting signs of the same, add 9 and 3 to get 12 and tack on the common sign, so negative 12. Here's another one, and no matter how complicated they get, we follow the same procedure. That is, we write down the expression, and in the next step, we replace letters with numbers, and then we just kind of follow our nose through it according to the operations that are indicated. Here we go. We want to evaluate this expression, so we write the expression. When, X, excuse me, when Y is 2, and z is negative 4. So we replace this y with 2 and this z with negative 4. Now notice how everything else stays exactly the same in the problem. We're not trying to multiply anything, not trying to evaluate anything. It's just a, a sort of a blind replacement situation. And in, in that circumstance, we often have to introduce parentheses to contain the number that replaces the letter. All right, so that's the idea. Now, we follow our order of operations agreement. It says to take care of the exponents. Well, here we have an exponent. 2 squared would give us 4 here, and we bring down all the rest of the business. All right, now we look around to see if we can't work within the parenthesis. We have no more exponents to take care of, so we perform multiplications or divisions from left to right. Well, from left to right, we see a multiplication. Minus 1 half times 4. You see the 2 and the 4 can cancel, 2 into 2, 1, 2 into 4, 2. So this is really negative 1 over 1 times 2, or simply negative 2. And now I bring down all this other stuff, and again, left to right, multiplications and divisions, I see a multiplication right here. Minus times minus is plus, 3 fourths times 4, the 4's cancel, leaving a 1, 3 times 1, 3. And then negative 2 plus 3 is 1. There's another interpretation for this one for this piece of it, and, and the interpretation is this, that it is the negative of, or subtract, three-fourths times negative four. You see, and if you interpret it that way, here's what you're going to get. You would have the negative two, and then I want to subtract this product, and this product, it turns out to be, let's see, the fours would cancel, and I have three times negative one, that's negative three, and you see, then I would have this double sign situation, which I separate with a parenthesis, Minus negative 3, or subtract negative 3, means to add the opposite, or it means negative 1 times negative 3, which is plus 3. In any event, we get negative 2 plus 3, just like we did up here, and 1 is the result as expected. Let's go through all the steps with this one. Evaluate this expression when A and B have certain values. Okay, evaluate the expression means we're going to write the expression. Replace letters with numbers only in the first step. So I have minus 2 times A is negative 3 fifths, B is 2 fifths, plus B squared, B is 2 fifths, then plus A squared, A is negative 3 fifths squared. Now we kind of step back and look at it a moment. 
and our order of operations says to perform operations in parentheses. We look in each little parenthesis, but we only have single items in those parentheses, so we can't simplify any further within parentheses. But we can take care of the exponents from left to right. We would square here, and we need to square here. Now, can we do them both at the same time? That's, that's rather optional. They have nothing to do with one another. They don't interact with one another. They're not nested within one another. So we can perform them both at the same time. But we don't want to be doing this in the same step. We don't want to uh, do it, perform any operations here is what I'm talking about. All right, squaring two-fifths means two-fifths times two-fifths. So this becomes 4 over 25. And now, squaring this, it's, we have two factors of negative 3 fifths. Negative 3 fifths times negative 3 fifths. Negative times negative is positive. 3 times 3, 9. 5 times 5, 25. Now we step back and we look at it again. And we think, well, according to the order of operations agreement, we perform multiplications and divisions from left to right. So let's see, from left to right, oh, I'm bumping into a multiplication right here. Negative times negative is positive. 2 times 3 fifths, remember this is 2 over 1, and we're going straight across. 2 times 3 is 6. 1 times 5, 5. You see, and it's positive. Now I can contain this within parenthesis or not, but I certainly need to contain this 2 fifths in parenthesis. And let's see, we have uh, 6 fifths times 2 fifths. 6 times 2, 12. 5 times 5, 25. Bring down the other terms. And oh, happy day, we have common denominators here, so we can just add the fractions. Adding the fractions means to add the numerators. And in the past, we have put, we have written a new fraction, which would be 12 plus 4 plus 9 all over 25. I think we can see through that now. 12 and 4 would be 16, and 9 would be 25 for the numerator. So it's really 25 over 25, which is just 1 for the answer. Before we simplify expressions, let's get straight on a little vocabulary. Terms that are involved in an expression like this are the items which can be separated with plus signs. They are, therefore, the add-ins. So one term in, in this expression is 3x squared, another uh, term is 7x, and another term is 4. So this expression has three terms. Now, in this expression, we might think, well, gee, we don't have uh, items that are separated with plus signs, but we can imagine that, we can transform this into such a situation like this. We can think of minus 6xy as being plus a negative 6xy for the purposes of identifying terms, you see. And now we can easily identify the terms as 7x squared, uh, negative 6xy, x, and negative 8. But can't we see those terms up here? Can't we see that 7x squared is a term? And if we just consider, we know this can happen, then we can tell that negative 6xy is a term just by looking at it like this. And in a similar way, we could have had a minus 8 here, and we could say, oh, okay, negative 8 is another term because we know it can be transformed in this kind of thing. So we don't always have to rewrite in order to be able to see the terms as add-ins. Now, the, we said before that letters, excuse me, that numbers that appear without letters are called constants. And so the negative 8 is a constant term. Now, variable terms, and the rest of the terms here are variable, and these two terms are variable, and there's a constant. But variable terms actually have two components within them. They have a number part and a letter part. And the, the, the number part is called the numerical coefficient. And the other part, the part involving letters, is logically called the variable part. So here, the coefficient or the numerical coefficient, and we say numerical just for emphasis, but if you just say the word coefficient, then it, it, it uh, implies that we're talking about the number involved. So the coefficient here, the numerical coefficient is 7, and the variable part is x. And here, the numerical coefficient is 3, the variable part is x squared. 
Here, the, the numerical coefficient is 7. Here, the numerical coefficient is negative 6. What's the numerical coefficient here? You see, that, that, that might be a good question. Is it 0 because nothing appears? Well, no. It's the number that's multiplied times a letter. We certainly don't have 0 times x here. We have an understood 1. You see, if, if an x is written without a number, then there's an understood 1 in here uh, as the other factor, as the numerical factor. So 1 is the coefficient here, and x is the variable part. OK, so that's the idea. Now, we can begin to manipulate um, expressions by identifying like terms. Like terms are terms that have exactly the same variable part. That is, they have the same letters and the same exponents involved with them. So they are terms that have the same letters and the same exponents. So in an expression like this, we can identify, well, let's see, are these two terms the same? Go like this. No, they're not the same because although they have the same letters, those letters don't have the same exponents on them. So those two terms are not like terms. On the other hand, this term and this term are like terms because they both have y squares in them. The variable part is y squared in both of them. Now, we're not concerned about the coefficient, about the numerical coefficient. We're just looking at the, the letter part, the variable part, in identifying like terms. In a similar way, these two are like terms. So 3y, 5y are like terms. Now, it turns out that once we're able to identify like terms, we can bring those terms together just by collecting the coefficients. And, and that kind of makes sense because we have 8 y squared and 9 y squared, doesn't it make sense that all together, how many y squares do we have? 8 and 9? Oh, we have 17 y squared. I could even think that, well, let's see, we have 8 y squared, so I could write it as y squared plus y squared plus y squared plus y squared, 8 of them, you see, and over here I have 9 of them, so all together I have mm, 17 of them, you see. So to bring together like terms, you just add coefficients. Now, technically, we can think of our, how, what gives us the right to do this? Well, our commutative and associative properties of addition and multiplication come into play in all of this process. We may or may not write a step such as this, for example. We may think that we can just swap these two because by using the commutative property. Remember, the commutative property has to do with the order of, of items. So using the commutative property of addition, we can swap the order of these two. And I would then have and then using our associative property of addition, we can associate or think of these two guys together and then these two together. You see, so think of those as a pair and these as a pair, and we're emphasizing the idea that we're bringing these together to become 17y squared. And then we bring these together, 3y and 5y. How many overall total y's do we have? We have three of them here, five of them here, for a total of eight. So we have 8y. So we have simplified like this. And we don't need to go through all of this discussion about this step. In the future, we may not do this very much. We can simply identify the like terms and look at them and target them as, as being candidates to be brought together. So we see these as like terms, bring them together for 17y squared. See these as like terms, bring them together for 8y. In this one, identify like terms. By the way, the z's, the z letter sometimes is, is written with a little mark like this through the z to identify it as distinct from a 2. Uh, some people make twos like this, you see, and it looks an awful lot like a Z. So to prevent that confusion, the little mark is made through the Zs. Anyway, we have 8Z here, we have 2Z here. These are like terms. They can be brought together. The minus 5 is a constant. It has no like term counterpart. By the way, constants are, uh, if I had two constants here, they would be like terms with one another and could be brought together. But I don't. So I can bring together the like terms. 8z plus 2z. 8 and 2 is 10z minus 5. You see, you just bring down the terms that you don't end up collecting or operating on. So this is the simplified version of that expression. Let's look at another one. We have one here. Now, look for the like terms, and let's just bring them together. Now, you bring them together by bringing together the coefficients or the numerical coefficients, whether they're positive or negative. So let's see. We have 
negative 4z squared. This is a term which is like this one because they have the same variable part. And we bring those terms together by collecting the numbers, the minus 4 with 5. Negative 4 with 5 is 1. So we have 1z squared. And I generally would not write the 1, I would just write the z squared. And then I would bring together the constants. 8 minus 3 is 5, so plus 5. Now once again, and you'll see in your textbook that you, there is the possibility of, of a re-manipulation in the problem to put the terms that are alike next to one another. And we can do that with our commutative and associative ideas uh, for addition. And your teacher may require that you do that uh, the first few t with the first few problems that you work. But you end up with this as the result. Now let's perform some other operations. And the other operations are relatively easy if you realize that we're just following the rules that we've established before. For instance, here we have negative 5 times 4x. Well, remember that 4x means 4 times x. When a letter and a number are next to one another, it implies that they're to be multiplied. So really, we just have three items to be multiplied here. Negative 5 times 4 times x. And we can reassociate in this multiplication process. You see, we can reassociate by thinking of negative 5 times 4. Let me emphasize the, the notion like this. We have three things to be multiplied, and rather than multiply these two, we can multiply these two. You see, negative 5 times 4 is negative 20, and then bring down the x. Now, we probably wouldn't write this step, but this is what gives us the right to or allows us to, to perform this multiplication. What we would just do is say, okay, numbers times numbers and letters times letters. We don't have other letters besides this x, but the numbers times numbers, negative 5 times 4 is negative 20, and bring down the x factor. And here, in a similar way, we could go through the process of changing this around a little bit to put the numbers next to one another using the commutative property of, uh, of multiplication. We could write the negative 7 over here and then the 3 in, and then we could reassociate, you see, and, and put these two together as factors. <coughs> And I'm thinking of it like this now for the association of these two uh, factors. So negative 7 times 3 is negative 21 in for the result. But we can see it from way up here. Negative 7 times 3, oh, that would be negative 21, and just bring down the n. Now, <clears throat> when we have more than one term within parentheses, we, we look to see if we can simplify in some way first. And we see here that we can't simplify this. This x plus 5 is in simple form. We can't bring together, for example, like terms. All right, so now we multiply, because the parenthesis implies multiplication, we multiply by the number next to the parenthesis. And in multiplying like this, we're using what's called the distributive property. Now, the distributive property means that this 4 is distributing itself as a multiplier throughout the terms within parentheses. So this really means that this 4 is to be multiplied times the x, and the 4 is also to be multiplied times the 5. So 4 times x would be 4x, and 4 times 5 would be 20. You see, the 4 is distributing itself as a multiplier throughout the parenthesis. So that's the idea, the distributive property. And here we can use the distributive property again. Negative 3 is multiplied times every term within the parenthesis. So it's going to be negative 3 times this term, and then negative 3 times this term. Now sometimes it, it makes the problem look more complicated if you actually write what is to be multiplied. That is, if I, I could write here negative 3 times 2x, and then plus negative 3 times 7. And that is technically correct. But what happens next is, follows pretty much from what we see up here. That is, it's negative 3 times 2x, negative 6x. But can't we see that from right here? Sure we can. And over here, we have negative 3 times 7 is negative 21. So ne minus 21 is what's going to end up right here. And we have negative 3 times 7 is negative 21. See, we can see it from up here rather than having to write that step. Okay, so that step is kind of optional at this point. 
in a problem like this, now remember the order of operations agreement, we would look within the parenthesis to see if we can simplify. We can't simplify this expression. So we perform multiplications and divisions from left to right. Well, I see a multiplication that's implied with this parenthesis. So I'll leave the 5 in alone, and I'm multiplying negative 3 times 2n minus 4. So it's negative 3 times 2n is negative 6n. And then negative 3 times negative 4. Negative times negative, positive. 3 times 4, 12. And now I look to see what I have. Well, I have a couple of like terms here that can be brought together by bringing together their numerical coefficients. 5 minus 6 is negative 1. So we have negative 1n, or simply negative n, bring down plus 12. When they become more complicated, no fear, we just follow our nose through it and understand that we're taking this step by step, following the order of operations agreement. We look within the parenthesis to see if we can perform any operations. No, we can't. So we multiply, we perform multiplications from left to right. I see one right here. Three times the terms within parenthesis. And just separate your thinking and go through carefully and methodically. Three times C is 3C. Then 3 times negative 2, negative 6. And now I'll bring down all the rest of the business. And you might say, why didn't I go ahead and multiply this? Well, I could have. But I, I performed this operation, and, and uh, the problem is complicated, so I don't want to take any chances. So I perform that operation, and I bring everything else down. Now I'll look to see what I have. OK, I've got a multiplication right here. So I've got 3C minus 6, and then 2 times c plus 6. 2 times c, 2c. 2 times 6, 12. Now I step back and look to see what I have, you see. And I, I have a number of terms here, just a string of terms, and I see that these two terms are alike, so I can bring them together. Three.